do you ever feel like, yeah, I can follow a watercolor tutorial, but how do I create my own landscapes? Well, in this video, I'm going to share with you my watercolor landscape formula, and I will take you through my entire process of painting a landscape from start to finish. I'll be using 140 pound cold press watercolor paper. I've been loving this Baohong block, and I'll also be using a variety of round brushes, small and big, as well as a flat brush and a large wash brush. I'll also be using my X-Acto knife to make some scratches. And I'm using my Daler Rowney set of watercolor paints that I like to use for tutorials. All right, so let's get into my landscape formula. The first part of the formula is the sky. The second part is the background. And then the third part is the foreground. So we have three main sections. Each section has different things we need to think about and figure out before we start painting. What's the weather like? Is it cloudy? Is it stormy? Is it snowy? And then I'm writing down what I want to do for this painting. Uh, what's the time of day? Is it morning? Is it midday? Sunset? Sunrise? Is it pitch black? Is it dark? What objects are going to be in the sky? birds, trees getting in the way, things like that. And then I do a couple of quick painting swatches based on how I want the colors of the sky to look. Then we have the background. So we need to figure out what's in the background. How high is it going to be? Are there going to be mountains in the back? Or where is the horizon point? Where's the perspective? Is it one point or two point? So for me, I'm doing kind of low distant tree line, no mountains, but kind of tall trees midway. And then for the perspective, you want something that is a lot smaller in the background that comes into the foreground to give it nice perspective. So I'm doing that with a fence. And then some of those trees that are midway are going to be our focal point. Now we get into the foreground. The foreground is where we have all of the details. It's everything that is closest to us at the bottom of the paper. So we need a focal point. We need details. We need movement. So for this piece, the focal point is going to be that fence that is giving us perspective going into the background is going to be coming into the foreground and is going to be a main character. We're going to have very grassy details in the front and a path that is moving around the front to give us lots of nice curvature and movement that's not going into the background. Then I paint the swatches and now I have my guide. I have my formula and I know exactly how I want to set up this painting. So the first thing that I do is I sketch everything out. Watercolor is transparent and so you will see pencil sketches underneath it. So just keep your pencil sketches really light. So because I'm keeping it light, it's probably hard to tell what I'm doing, but I'm getting the main characters onto the paper. I've got the horizon line, I've got my big trees that are kind of midway in the background, I've got those distant trees in the back as well, as well as this fence that's giving us a lot of perspective, smaller in the background and getting bigger as it's getting into the foreground, and then also this path that is curving in the front, creating lots of movement, but staying in the foreground. I'm also going to do a couple of clouds in the sky as well, just so that I remember to do the clouds. Sometimes I get a little excited about the paint, but this is the sketch up close and now we can get started because we have our formula and our template. I will say 90% of the time or 99% of the time I start with the sky. And typically because I do a very, blended sky with lots of colors and clouds, I will wet the paper first with a large wash brush. So I'm just getting everything above the horizon line wet. And then I'm going in with my first color, which is a really bright yellow orange, because I'm thinking of the sunrise um, kind of coming up over the trees. We want yellows and oranges and pinks, and then we'll go into the blue sky at the top. If your paper has dried a little bit, you saw I used my wash brush. I just kind of wet it and helped blend it up again because I don't want any harsh, um, hard lines in my sky. I want it to be really wet so that everything blends and moves around really nicely. Um, I'm using my round brush to put the color in and then just using my wash brush to get more of a bigger, wispier look. So I've put down my pink and now I'm placing the blue at the very top and kind of doing a negative painting 
painting around where the clouds would be. The paper is still wet enough that I'm getting nice blending, but it's dry enough that the paint isn't blending into that white space and I'm getting some nice shapes for my clouds. And then while everything is still wet, I just continue to mess with it to make sure it looks good because I like painting the sky in one go. I don't come back to it after it's dry. So I'm making sure that I like the way the colors are all blended together. I add more color if I need to. Um, here I'm adding some darker blue around the edges at the top and also underneath the clouds to give a little bit more dimension and depth to the clouds. Sometimes I call this the painting dance. Everything's dancing around trying to look perfect um, until I finally decide to stop touching it. <laughs> so at this point I'm done with this guy. But before it completely dries, I like to add in some of my trees and my tree line so that it is a really soft blend while it is barely wet on the background. So you can see I'm starting with a really light sap green going into some darker sap green, but I'm letting that blend into the sky so that I have a really fuzzy kind of distant tree look by the time that it dries. And then I'm using my large wash brush just to kind of blend everything out because everything below that horizon line wasn't wet. So there's no bleeding and blending. So I'm just kind of mixing all of those colors in. I use a lot of yellows and yellow ochre in this piece as well. Um, another thing to consider when you're painting landscapes is where is your light coming from? And when I did the sky, I felt like I was heavy on the left side of my painting with the sun, maybe the sunrise coming from that side. So all of my light is going to be hitting from the left side first with shadows based on the right side. So a lot of the ways that we do that with landscapes is lighter, brighter colors, more yellow, especially if you've got this kind of grassy um, countryside landscape and then we can get dimension in our fields and in our grass by doing more depth of color uh, more trees and um, darker greens coming on the right side or wherever the opposite side of our light source is here i am putting in some darker colors for the horizon line and those distant trees so right towards the center are my main focus background trees so i'm kind of framing those in with those distant trees and while those center trees that are in the background are still wet i'm also going to be adding in some colors i just kind of bounce around my painting honestly depending on what color i have on my brush because a lot of the colors can be used in different places and I'm trying to get a lot of that blending and bleeding effect on this first layer. And so I bounce around while everything, you know, is still wet. Also, I just want to say that if you're someone who wants to mostly just watch the process, there are going to be lots of times in this video where I'm not going to talk and you can just relax and watch and enjoy with some nice music because I know a lot of you like that. I get comments about that all the time. That you like the real time slow painting videos so you can analyze the process and i know that a lot of you really want the tips how can i apply this why are you doing it how do i replicate this so i will definitely pop in and continue to say words but also know that you can just mute me too <laughs> um so i'm adding in as you can see lots of different colors and mostly just bouncing back and forth between using yellows greens indigo um, yellow ochre this area here on the landscape you, you know how I, I added that yellow and the green and then i stopped and i left those lines jagged it's because when i was painting them i wasn't quite sure where i was going to end those colors and I didn't want to get ahead of myself and lose some of my white space or my lighter areas so I just stopped so I feel like that's a good lesson in if you're not sure where to go maybe just wait 
And I feel like it helped this painting so much because even at the end, when I look at the painting, the lighter areas that I left open in the middle really help ground the painting um, and because some of the areas get really dark. So here I am going to kind of outline the path with some of the grassy texture and I will let you listen to some music now. You can kind of watch the process of how I'm filling it in. Um, also know that sometimes while I'm painting these landscapes, I am like, huh, what am I going to put here? What am I going to do there? If you question it, just leave it alone for a second or walk away. Come back and look at it. At one point in this painting, I am not kidding. I thought, well, that's ugly. And I almost threw the painting away and scrapped this entire video. And then I kept going and I love it at, by the end. But watercolor has a lot of ugly stages. Anyway, I said I was going to let you watch. <laughs> Just remember, watercolor has ugly stages. It almost always can be worked out. So at this point, we have our first layer of watercolor down. So the first layer kind of establishes our shapes, our colors, and we get our lighter values down. Don't forget that with watercolor, we start with our lighter colors so that we can build. Because I like to follow the old school rules of watercolor where we're not adding gouache or acrylic on top. We're trying to maintain our white space we're trying to maintain our light colors as much as possible. So we work light to dark and we are layering and building our values and contrast. We start with our light values and then you can see even here with this tree, I am starting to add in my darker values. So it's going to look like a more multi-dimensional tree because we'll still be able to see our lighter values, our middle values, and then our darkest values by the time that we're done with the details and everything. So trust the process because that light value layer between that light value layer and the middle value layer where things start to get darker is just such an ugly stage, but it works out in the end.
So at this point I've placed a lot of values in for the trees. They're not totally finished yet, but now I'm going to focus on the fence. Make sure that with perspective, you have this angle coming from left to right and that everything that is farthest away from you is smaller and closer together. And then as it's coming closer towards you or towards the bottom of your paper, it's getting bigger and the posts are getting farther apart. Now you can see with the little posts in between the posts, they're not totally connected. They're not totally combined. I'm kind of imagining that as I'm adding the details later, I am going to have maybe some grass peeking up through those posts. So kind of think about like what else is going to be going here later. I don't want to outline the perfect details of everything quite yet. Just getting down those colors for the initial layer of something sometimes is enough. And then you can go back and the details will look even better. Then I'm picking up some darker contrasting colors and I want to kind of outline some of the grassy areas. So this space that has the lighter area above the fence, I want to kind of outline that like maybe there's a dirt patch there. Um, so I'm kind of outlining it with grass and then I'm strengthening the colors in the tree line and in those background trees as well. Now I am focusing on the path a little bit. I really like to do that dry brush technique where I kind of swipe my brush on the side, giving it lots of texture, especially for things that are like dirt. Um, so I do some of that as well as having some little divots and kind of dark spots, thinking of like a hole in the ground or maybe there's a rock somewhere. So don't feel like it's got to be a perfect dirt path. A little bit of organic messiness looks really nice when you're trying to make something look chaotic on purpose. <laughs> and if you ever feel like the marks that you're making don't look right, you can rinse your brush and with a damp brush, kind of loosen everything up, smooth it out, or even completely take it away. So this area down towards the middle left, this big patch of green, is our detailed grassy area. So if we think about our formula, our guide that we made over to the left, down in the foreground where everything is bright and detailed, I have this patchy piece of grass. So this area of grass is going to be more detailed than our background trees that are kind of midway because we are seeing them up close. It's not going to be as much of a blob as the trees are. So when you're painting things in the foreground, remember 
you're going to see them clearer. They're going to be a lot more detailed. So I'm going to like make sure those strokes are exact. Um, I also thought the background needed a little bit more color. So I went in with more of an orangey yellow ochre color and my wash brush and just kind of did a couple of swipes. And I just thought it changed the entire painting in the best way. So I really was like, hey, how come I haven't been using my wash brush as much for the rest of the piece, not just not just for the sky? So another reminder for you. Um, and then I got really excited about using my wash brush, but I thought, okay, I think it's too big for the grassy area down here. So that's when I pulled out my flat brush and I was able to create the perfect grass with my flat brush. It's possible to use your round brush for everything, but if you have a flat brush, why not use it, right? So you can see on this grassy area, I was able to maintain my lightest bright yellow green values, create mid values, and then went through with darker values and how much contrast and depth that starts to create. And again, I really like to frame the paintings. And so you can see on the corner there, I've just got a lot of dark color. I also felt like the grass on the other side of the path needed a little bit more shape as if the grass was a hill leading down to the path. So then I took some darker paint, created some grassy strokes in a curved motion, and that alone changed the entire feeling of that area as well. So don't take for granted how much movement plays a role and how just angling your brush in a different way or moving the strokes up and around in a curved motion really can give you a whole new perspective on the painting. And it's always at this point in the painting where we're starting to get into the details where I breathe a sigh of relief and I think, okay, I'm so, okay. I knew I had a vision for a reason. I knew I was going to like this in the end, right? And that's why the formula and the plan that I have over to the left, I feel like is really important because I knew exactly where I was going and I just needed to trust the process <laughs> and get through those ugly first stages. So now I'm using my X-Acto knife to scratch some of the paper and some of the watercolor off the paper. Typically watercolor artists do this when they want kind of a little highlight on a rock or highlight on a tree branch. And so I'm doing this after the watercolor has dried so that I get a very exact line um, of this little white highlight in the tree. It's just so that you can have a little bit more of a bright detail and that the trees, especially the background trees, 
aren't just a big brown and green blob. So even though it's really light and you can't really see it, I do feel like it really helps those trees that had kind of become a big brown and green blob. So I have really nice high quality watercolor paper and so this really works well for me. Um, it will just depend on your paper. And then I'm going through with some darker paint um, for the tree trunk, tree branches. And I'm doing some darker paint on the opposite side of the highlights. So it just increases that contrast. Now I've reached the point in the painting where I can feel I am coming to the end. So I am doing more fiddling where I am just seeing what details can be added. What little tiny bits of grass need to be kind of stamped in. I feel like I needed some dark grass and maybe some darker, more distant posts in the fence. So I do add a little bit more there. Um, stamping in some even darker details with that flat brush in the grass and some darker details of dirt kind of surrounding this path, kind of framing it, making sure we have really dark values in the path. But you can feel it that if I go too far, I'm going to overwork it. So I'm playing with that line of overworking it, but also having enough details that it looks right. A good rule of thumb to tell when you're done is if you can see light values, medium values, dark values, and details. The last piece that I haven't forgotten about is adding birds. And I'm of the opinion that we should try to add birds that actually look like birds, have a little bit of a bird shape. So I try to do a long sideways teardrop for the body with some little wings coming off and maybe a tiny tail 
alternating, you know, which bird wings are pointed up, which are maybe in the flapping downward position. And I kind of did a light brown color for these birds. But we just want a lot of movement and something a little bit more than the typical V shape. And the landscape is finished. Thank you so much for being here while I went over my landscape formula and painted a landscape with you today. I hope you got a lot out of it and you feel more confident knowing how to paint your own landscapes going forward. I know you can do it and they will be beautiful. I'll see you all next time. Bye.